Now we're inside the beautiful temples of Luxor. On this wonderful day in Egypt, Northeast Africa. Here, here goes some devils as usual. All over the place. A good similarity from the temple of Karnak, temples of Karnak. But this one is a lot smaller. Over here, these, these statues and monuments do the wear of weather. They fall into pieces little by little. And, and by a good guess, uh, you can tell uh, this is Ramsey the Great, Ramsey the Second, my new idol. Southern house. It was the house of Amon Ra partly but mainly his wife Mut. If you take a look back there you'll see the human head Sphinx Avenue. And that was the processional way. Whoa. The processional way leading the sacred part of the king of the god back to the temple of the Khan. Two miles. We have excavated this part. Some others are buried under some of the houses and they are doing some excavation for the others in the open air but it goes for two miles. This temple mainly was built by three kings, or three rulers. Amenophis III, the father of Akhenaten, Ramesses II, our famous one, and Queen Hatshepsut. So Queen Hatshepsut, before both of them, that means the oldest part in this temple is for Queen Hatshepsut. The facade, of course, for Ramesses II. On both sides, on the pylon, we see again the Battle of Kadesh. Remember, I talked about that yesterday. So on the right hand side, you'll see the king seated on his throne in the training camp. The soldiers are training around him. On the other side, this is the battle itself. The king over there is running over the enemies. The enemies are under the hooves of his animal or his horse, and he is using his bow. And if you take a look to the left side, you see something looks like a circle. Can you see it? This is the Orontes River, and in the middle, this is Kaddish. It was uh, a peninsula the peninsula of Kaddish, and that's the main city for this battle over there. Where, where is Kaddish? Uh, it's right, right by the Orontes River near Syria and Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. Would that be like a map blown up there? A what? A map. A kind of, not a map, it's showing the battle, the location of the battle. But, I thought you but said, it's not a map. Yeah, no, I thought you said that represented the, that particular city. Yes, that they're well, fighting. The, the city of Kaddish, yeah. and it's over there right in the middle between the two branches of the river, and that's the Orontes River, and this is Kaddish. It's the battle, not the map. What's the battle? The battle between yeah. the... In the between you know Ramesses II and the Hittites. the Hittites. I talked about that yesterday, remember? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Actually, on both sides of the entrance, we have the seated statues of Ramesses II, and they are flanking the entrance. We should have also... Shit. We should have also four statues on both sides, two standing statues on each side representing Ramesses II. Also, you can see one obelisk right here. There, was, there used to be two, one on each side. Where is the other one? In Paris. Actually, Muhammad Ali, the founder of, not the boxer, the founder of modern Egypt, 1805, he constructed a big mosque in Cairo. We know it as the mosque of Muhammad Ali. While he was building this mosque, he received a gift from the French king Louis Philippe of France. A big tower clock to decorate this mosque. In return, he gave the obelisk. Was it, I heard the clock wasn't working. And the clock didn't work. <laughs> so he gave this obelisk in return of a clock that never ever worked. French made. Did, did, did he get revenge? He didn't care. I mean, if he gives something, it doesn't belong to him. It's an obelisk. What is it? It's a stone. Let's give it 
to the Frenchman. Let's give him a stone. For Muhammad Ali, it's just a stone. It means nothing. That's why lots of our monuments went back or went out of the country by the Turkish as gifts to many kings, especially or rulers, especially in the area of Europe. Down below the other obelisk, you will see four baboons. The baboons, the ancient Egyptians notes that early in the morning, they wake up at the, at the same time with the sunrise, jumping, looking up like they are hailing the sun, making lots of noise. So they were chosen to be the followers of Gadra. They represent Gadra, that's why they are at the bottom below the obelisk, and four means the four directions of the earth, north, south, east, and west. By the way, the southern part of Egypt and the northern part of Egypt, the south, we call it Upper Egypt. The north, lower Egypt. Why is that? It's the elevation. The south is higher than the north. That's why the Nile is flowing from south to north. Kind of a strange, but that's the way it is. Follow me. But it's the way we would normally As you can see, it's a lot of devils all over the place. Like a, like a, like a devil's convention. We gonna we gonna keep that we gonna keep our eyes on them though. We know they have to know good. Oh, Mr. But you know, yeah, like my man said, that's the creators of the world. Hey, just being real. Behind the two pylons, right here, you can see this shrine, which was built by Queen Hatshepsut, 1500 BC. So this is the oldest thing, right here. That means this shrine was there before building any part of the temple. Dedicated to the triad of Egypt's Amon Ra, Mut, and Tonsu. Not the different type of columns here. These columns representing a bundle of papyrus joined together, forming a column. Actually, if you take a look over there, that should be the axis of the temple, right? And the orientation of this temple is north-south, or south-north. So the sanctuary over there will be the oldest part after, of course, this shrine. So they start building from inside toward the outside. So moving this way, that means they needed to destroy the shrine to continue building the temple. Of course, they cannot do that to the shrine of the gods. That's why they took a right curve a little bit to continue the axis of the temple. So this temple has a kind of a curved axis, not a straight axis, to maintain this shrine. Over there. The other strange thing is if you look up there, you'll see a mosque. This mosque dates back to the 12th century AD. How come that this mosque is up there? Why? Isn't that strange? Well, actually, the river Nile used to bring lots of silt covering the area, so that was the ground level. I will show you a very strange picture. That was the dates back to the 19th. So now it's a lot wider than it is so now. That's the ground level. So see what what is the part, the, the statue out there? Mm -hmm. That's the only part that was above the ground, mm -hmm. right from the shoulder. The rest of the temple, the rest of the statues were right below the ground. So the ground level was up there. The people lived at that level. See the picture? When was this taken? In the uh, end of the 19th century. Yeah, by the end of the 19th century. So they had to this entire thing. The entire thing was under the, 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 the nice so the these are all of them. These are all statues of Ramsey the Great. As you can see, um, <laughs> that heavy on both sides. On, on the right hand side, he is holding. Notice, see that? On the left hand side, holding papyrus. Papyrus is north, notice is south. Also on his head, he has two modices. On the right hand side, notice on the right hand side, papyrus. Both papyrus, notice, and papyrus are tied, are, are tied together around this object in the middle. What is this object? It's the lungs and the trachea of the king. That means both north and south are united together because of the king as he is representing the gods, and also both north and south receiving their breath through the lungs of the king as the most important person for the ancient Egyptian. Down below, you'll see the enemies, the symbols of the empire. Empire. These are the northern, these the Asharic or the Libyans. Notes they are represented with fear. 
but not on the other side. They also represented their brothers, the Nubians, the South. But do they have beards? No. Why? They still respect them. They have a respect for them. So they are not barbarics. So no beards. But they are represented with the facial features of Africa. And of course, they use rings. We have found many statues for ancient Egyptian kings with the pierced earlock. We have found some of the mummies, or most of the mummies for the kings, especially in the new empire, with the pierced earlock. That means they used rings, which is typically an African, an African one. Culture. An African culture. The pharaoh was represented with a false beard. This is a statue of Ramsey the Great, Ramsey the Second, and his wife Nefertari. Inside the temples of Luxor, it is incredibly beautiful out here. Mm. You're witness. You're witnessing greatness at its best. And the Nile River, this is the East Bank, and the Nile River is straight ahead behind these temple walls. Which was built by Amir of Israel, 1400 BC. When Alexander the Macedonian came, Egypt was occupied by the Persians. The Persians treated the Egyptians very bad. They did not respect the religion, the tradition, the gods, the kings. The Egyptians were treated like slaves or second-class citizens. That's why the Egyptians hated the Persians. When Alexander came, he was so smart. He knew that if you want to get the Egyptians to your side, she would respect their religion, their gods, their kings. That's why when he came, he got the Persians out of Egypt. He called himself the son of God Ra. He represented himself as a pharaoh, and he started building for God Haman Ra. So in Luxor, he has built this sanctuary inside the original sanctuary. So these are the walls of the original sanctuary, 1400 BC. This sanctuary was built inside in below Alexander the 332 BC. So between these two walls, we have a south in Egypt. Notice the kind of relief here. This is a raised relief, and that's the hardest part. You have to chisel away the background. This is very easy, chiseling away the figure of itself. Here, as you can see, God aids the perfect, the creator of everything. He is leading Alexander the Macedonian from his hands to meet him with God's aim of God. And he is giving him life, represented as the symbol of life through his nostrils, and Alexander himself is holding the symbol of life. And here, you can see Alexander the Macedonian as a pharaoh, and he even put his name inside the cartouche. Alexander was here in front of a god. This is God Amen and me with the erected fellows. That's the image of fertility for God Amen and Ra. They call him even Ka Mut F, the name of this god. Of course, he was a symbol of fertility even for humans. That's why we see Alexander the Macedonian burning incense before the fellows, and he is pouring something right here. What is that? Let us oil. They believe that let us oil is an aphrodisiac. That's let us oil. That's why it is here poor before that's what that I'm talking about. the image of fertility for God, Amen Ra. But it seems that he doesn't need this. Let us oil. This one. Let's go. My brothers and sisters, I'm in the Luxor temples in Luxor, Egypt, Northeast Africa. Yes, once again, Egypt is in Africa. I'm standing right on the right on the continent of Africa in the country of Egypt. Right here we have a statue of Ramses the Great, Ramses II. This is my new hero and my new idol. We need more strong power like Ramses the Great to lead our future into the new revolution. This signifies greatness and uh, one thing you have uh, hear a lot about is Ramses II, and he has stand out more amongst uh, more. He stand out more amongst the rest of the pharaohs. And uh, 
once I get back home to Atlanta, I will get into a little more studies of Ramses II. But uh, the show needs of this beautiful footage of Egypt. Black power, black unity, black nationalism. Peace! Right here, this is Queen Nefertari, the wife of Ramses II. Back up on the bus, the revolutionary bus. It's our bus driver right here. Hold it down. Until next time, friend. Alright, right now we're about to leave the revolutionary bus and head on our ship, our boat ride down the Nile. We've been docked for about a day. So now we're about to cruise down the now, all the way down to Aswan. That's our luxury ship right there. Yes, this is the world famous Nile River. The longest and most popular in the world. And it's just, it's, it's an honor to be taking a cruise down the now to learn more about the history of my ancient African ancestors. So, um, hold on and now um, as we take you on this beautiful journey. These are shops outside of the loading dock at Luxor. You can have a look here. How's it going, brother? Excuse me, Charlie. No chance for a look Gotta catch my boat ride. Now, as you can see, uh, we got some white devils on the top of the ship, trying to get a suntan. Hey! There we go! Radamus the second. Radimus 2, our luxury well, cruise line. Hey, right, my good friend. Beer, beer. Have a good time. Have a good time. Nice meeting you. There you go. We're All right, how did you? We're ready to go. We're ready to finish taking over our own history. What did I think? The most impressive was to know that they tried to destroy and couldn't even copy her correctly. Get your wet towel. So we know that we are just like Tafusi, full of thought, and Shem said, so we are still going to keep our history. That's what I'm talking about, sister. You see, you ready to roll, you ready to roll down the now? Yes. Right. And tell them your name again. My name is Rena Amos Brown. Live in what part of the United States of America you live in? Pittsburgh. By way of West Africa. Stolen from the land, but I'm coming back. Beautiful, I love it. Thank you. Can you believe Revolutionary Cam is taking me on a journey down the Nile? We're leaving the city of Luxor. That is the west bank of the Nile. And as you can see, got my revolutionary sister over there, uh, holding, it, holding it down. These devils keep on walking in my way. They need to practice on ducking, because you're going to be doing a lot of ducking. And the hot ones come your way. 
Yeah, he had a death in his family. My brothers and sisters, once again, you are live on Revolutionary Cam on the Nile River going south to Aswan. And just want to show you a little, give you an update on some new images. Our brothers and sisters here. We're all making deals. This is a way of life here. Selling some beautiful African garments and art. You know, close on a ship, little boat. A homemade, of course. This is another cruise ship. They're like a ship full of devils. They're all over the place. Give me a close up. Never ever leave me thank you a close up of these devils. Look at that. 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 Look at now here's another set of got the pool over there towards the front. Probably take a swim a little bit later on. Got the devils over here on the left. No. Can't you can no. Always around. No matter how you dodge them. They're around. Brothers and sisters, we are <laughs> buggy riding, or you can call it horse and carriage riding, to Bam Afu, Egypt, south of Luxor. Okay. Nubia. 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 Africa? Africa. Africano! Africano! That's Brother Thomas, outside of the temple of Edfu, in the city of Edfu. Like I always say, the writings on the wall. Writing, the writings are on the walls when you come to Egypt. If you want facts, these are facts. Young blood.
inside a temple of Edfu. This is just incredible and beautiful. I don't have the exact dimensions, but this is real high. After the city. Uh, the name of this city, the ancient name was Etibu. Etibu, which nowadays we say Etfu. But it's Etibu, the city of piercing. The city of piercing. Piercing like a spear. The city of piercing. Boating? Piercing. You mean piercing. for fish? Yeah, no, for, for killing, whatever. For killing. Oh, whatever. Piercing. Piercing. Yeah. Piercing. Yeah. piercing for killing devils. Yeah. Uh, the main gut right here is gut Horus. Actually, or Heru, of course. Sorry, if I'm, I'm, I'm not used to say Heru because I don't work a lot with African American groups. Lots of other groups they come here, so that's what my tongue is used to say. Aurus, Cyrus, and this kind of thing. Bring lots of you, and I'll be used to say that. Okay. So, uh, Aurus, the the elder, the Avenger, actually. We had many Aurus in ancient Egypt. This is Aurus, the Avenger. And there is a very important mythological legend behind this temple. And it's mainly discussing the struggle between good and bad, good and evil. It says like this, God Ra, the sun god, while the gods were still ruling the earth before they went up to heaven, he ruled from this spot right here, Itibu. And then he went to check the borders to the south, southern Nubi. And he left his son, Heru, here in this city to rule. Actually, the demons under the leadership of God Set, the evil God, found that it was a good opportunity to start plotting, making problems, revolting. Actually, Horus was strong. He fought back, but he couldn't stop them completely. He had to fly to his father. He went to meet his father, Gadra. He told him about the situation here. They were united together. They flew back together. They fought the enemies together. They defeated the enemies. The enemies, these guys as hippos and crocodiles, jumped into the Nile to hide. That's why in ancient Egypt, hippos and crocodiles represented evil. Besides, God said, of course, and we will talk about him in detail when we go to Aswan tomorrow, the Temple of Philip. Since that time, when they got their victory, <coughs> Ra ordered that a symbol of protection should be placed on the top of the entrances of any temple or tomb, which is, if you take a look over there, it's the winged solar disk. Can you see that? The winged solar disk, oh, the above the entrance in the middle. Oh, okay. The winged solar disk. The wings, of course, representing Heru, the solar disk representing Gadra. And you can see that we have two serpents coming out of them. These are the weapons they used against their enemies. It's a very important symbol. It's the symbol of protection. On any temple or any tomb, you should see this symbol up on the top of, above the entrance immediately. This temple actually was built during the Greco-Roman period. But when I say that, I don't mean it was built by the Greeks or the Romans. It was built by Egyptians. But, of course, when the Greeks came, they started to act as an ancient Egyptian king, so they had to show that they are building something for the gods, so they give orders for building here or building there, but the builders are Egyptians. And what year is this? Uh, <laughs> 230, between 237 BC and 58 AD, uh, BC. 237 BC to 58 BC, the time of the Ptolemy. It started with Ptolemy, the third, ending with Ptolemy the Twelfths. We call him Neus Dionysus, or the Piper. He is the father of Elizabeth Taylor, or actually Cleopatra <laughs> the Seventh. Have you seen the movie? Yeah. Actually, there are some truths, of course, but Cleopatra wasn't something like Elizabeth Taylor at all. She wasn't that beautiful. She was okay, but mostly she was highly educated, spoke in seven languages, very smart, okay? very cultural, that's how she succeeded to persuade Julius Caesar to marry her and later on 
Mark Antony. Highly educated, very well educated. And she wasn't pale skin. To me? And she wasn't pale skin. Well, actually, she wasn't African at all. No, no, no. She is Greek, from Greek origins. And actually, some scholars, they like to take Kiripata as an evidence that the Egyptians were not Africans. Mm -hmm. We do not care if she was black or not, because she is not Egyptian at all. She is from Greek descendants. She came with the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies came with Alexander. The man who actually, uh, 305, after the death of Alexander the Macedonian, his great empire had to be divided amongst the seven generals of his army. Egypt became the share of a man, his name was Ptolemy, son of Lagos. A very close friend of Alexander the Macedonian, and in spite of he was a few years older than him, but he was raised with him in the royal palace in Macedonia. This man was actually very strong and powerful man. His name became the title of the Greek rulers. His son, Philadelphus, became Ptolemy II. His grandson became Ptolemy III, all the way. His name became the title. So, starting from the 18th dynasty, the title of an ancient Egyptian king was Pharaoh. Starting from the Greek period, the title of the ruler of this county, a Ptolemy. So this is during the Greek Roman period, 237 BC till 58 BC, about 181 years to be finished. So this temple actually was excavated by August Marius, who came to Egypt in the middle of the 19th century, a French Egyptologist. And actually, when he came to this spot, this temple was covered with the sand up till the half of it. And the people lived in there. They had their houses, stables, they used to cook, have fire, and so. And the smut caused the black color in the ceiling, as you're going to see. This should be one of the most beautiful temples, but the ceiling destroyed completely because of the people who lived in there used fire for, for burning or for uh, cooking or for warming up in the water. You'll see that yourself. So again. Uh, Now this is what Walid was talking about, the burn ceilings. You know, you're a dumb devil, you're a stupid devil. You know, you're a dumb devil, you know that? Turn around so I can, so I can focus on you. Yes, you're a dumb devil, you're an idiot. Once again, you're live on Revolutionary Cam. I'm at the Edfu Temple in Edfu, Egypt. And we're taking a tour of this children. Great, 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 great craftsmanship of our ancient African ancestors. Earlier, one of these devils ran and complained to one of the guys that work here, saying I complained that I was touching the wall. This devil telling me I shouldn't touch the wall, touch the wall, the artwork that was done by my ancient African ancestors. I was about to go up on that devil. One day we're going to kill these dumb devils. They think it's funny, they, they, they think it's funny, keep smiling, keep joking, but we're coming for you devils. But anyway, this uh, enjoy this great great view of our African artwork and keep in mind I can only show you so much but the most important thing is for you to get a little get a good look at it, do your own research, get together and take a trip for repatriation and also to see some of the greatest work ever been done by not only our African ancestors but any human beings on this earth. We are in the streets of Edfu with a view of the East Bank from the West Bank of the Nile to the East Bank. Okay, meet it. We're now leaving the city of Edfu. Continuing on the 
on our journey down the Nile, going south to Aswan. They probably don't even know nothing about Nanny, man. <laughs> and again. We're at Kam Ambu Temple in Kam Ambu. I You're looking at a mummified crocodile. Here are Horus the Elder or Horus the Doctor. The other one is Sobek, the crocodile. The evil god. This is Sobek? Sobek. 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 The crocodile. And actually, the myth behind this temple is very simple, but it's also discussing the struggle between bad and good, or good and evil. Horus and his followers lived in around this area, and Horus was the good god. The main living was cultivation, agriculture. They grew everything here. They lived a very happy life, a nice area, fertile lands. But Sobek and his followers, they were so jealous of his brother and their followers. That's why they wanted to get them out of the area and seize the place. Horus invited them, come and live with us. No problem, we can live all together here, but they refused that. They insist on getting them out of here. They succeeded to do that after a while, then they seized the area, starting doing their own agriculture. Any kind of seed they spray, nothing grows. Stayed as barren hills, as long as they were there. They found out that they were doing something really wrong, and they needed to have a conciliation with Horus and his followers. So they got an agreement, they got back together, they lived in the same area, and they started agriculture again. Maybe this story is telling us about the bitter hostility in this area between mankind and crocodiles. It's a curve in the Nile, a shallow area like a small swamp. Crocodiles lived here before. And of course they were threatening the peasants and the farmers who lived in this area. Because a crocodile would look like a log swimming on the top of the water and suddenly he grabs somebody. And that what used to happen here. So they used to fight crocodiles, they used to kill crocodiles in this area because threatening the, the farmers and their families. So maybe this story is telling us about the bitter hostility between mankind and crocodiles. Uh, actually, as I said, it's a unique temple because besides it's a dual identity temple dedicated to two gods, actually it was a healing temple, like a hospital, to which pilgrims came spending the night waiting for their turn to meet the priests to receive <coughs> medical treatment, either for physical injuries or for physical problems or psychological problems. That's why it was a very important temple. Actually, this temple was built during the Greco-Roman period, or let's say rebuilt during the Greco-Roman period, 181 BC, 219 AD. It was a very important town during the Greco-Roman period as the elephants of the Roman army received training right here in this place. And on the way out, on the left-hand side, up on hill, you can see some traces of the old town, built with sun-dried mud. Let's go and see what it is. It's not a very big temple, actually. It's uh, much smaller than the others we have visited, and mostly destroyed because of the Nile flooding closer to this area. But some important spots I would like to talk about. A dual identity temple. This court was built by Emperor Tiberius, about 38 B.A.D. And you can see that this site was dedicated to Sobek. That's why I see on what is left of the column, that Sobek, or the crocodile. 
over there, and you can still see some of the color. These are the original colors of the temples. I want you to remember that color uh, temples were fully colored. The other side belongs to Horus, the elder or Horus. The doctor. As a pharaoh, as an ancient Egyptian king, wearing the kilts, and this is the tail of the bull, remember that? And he's being purified by Gajaputi and Horus. The water actually changed to be the symbol of life and the scepter of prosperity. So they are washing him and at the same time providing him with long life and prosperity. And the whole thing is taking place before Sobek. The crocodile god. He is watching him being purified. Actually, the idea of being purified is nowadays. For example, the Muslims before praying will do some purification with water. So before here, before meeting the god, before going before the god, before doing the service for the god, you should be purified at least. So not like the priest shaving or so, but at least you just wash yourself with water. And symbolically, in a metaphoric way, they wash him with life and prosperity. So you can see this is the eye of Horus. Isis on the bird's chair. And his sister. This is the underground chamber outside the courtyard of the temple. You're looking at an underground pit. Hi, my brothers and sisters, I'm in Kam Ambu, Egypt. At these beautiful temples, and you've just seen some of the great artwork once again done by our ancient Egyptian ancestors. This is a free your mind of mental slavery production, bringing you a visual from Africa to help you break the chains of mental bondage, the same bondage that's been destroying us and holding us back for 500 years. So what I'm doing is showing you some of our greatness, of our previous greatness, so that, can, so that we can use our, use our previous greatness as a tool to advance in this new world and take back charge. And as you can see, down from the temple, we have a beautiful view. And this is on the...